And that actually is a perfect uh, beginning because the point I'm going to make starting off is that since the Education Amendment of the Civil Rights Act or Title IX or the Patsy Mink Amendment as we know it was passed in 1972 <laughs> or back when it was passed, um, removing um, explicit quotas and explicit barriers to women entering medical schools, uh, it wasn't unreasonable to think that the lack of women leaders in medicine would fix itself. You know, once the pipeline was full, if we just waited long enough, everything would equilibrate. It would equilibrate at the leadership level, it would equilibrate in all the specialties. Um, and that if, you know, women just behaved like men, they would advance at the same rate, and that medicine was a meritocracy where women's and men's accomplishments would be viewed and rewarded equally, right? 1972 wasn't unreasonable to think that. No more quotas, women, doors are open. Okay, turns out that was woefully naive because here we are 40 some years later and it turns out that unconscious gender-based assumptions and stereotypes are deeply embedded in the patterns of thinking of both men and women. And that study after study after study with no change over the last 40 years confirms that women and work performed by women consistently receives lower evaluation than men and the work performed by men, even when the work is identical and regardless of the sex of the evaluators. Both men and women will rate the quality of women's work lower. So just to show you how this conspires against women's advancement, first we have to congratulate her. So these data are from the AAMC, so this shows um, the percent women at various levels throughout academic medicine, but if it was an in industry or other science, it would look similar. So we should congratulate ourselves that at the early pipeline levels, we have made tremendous progress since Title IX was passed in women entering science and medicine at the early stage. So almost 50% of medical students are women, although it's been dropping steadily since 2006, which is kind of interesting. Over 50% of PhDs in biomedical sciences go to women. And then you see this persistent drop off. So the percent women here is the blue bar, and you see this persistent drop off at every subsequent stage of a career. These are academic careers, but again, this same pattern is shown anywhere. So that the leadership level, this 15% women chairs, 15% women deans, has been pretty uh, stable for about the last 15 years or so. Okay, so to help understand this, so there are many contributing factors, but a root cause is the fact that culture creates and reinforces assumptions about men and women. So even if you don't believe that gender exists as a binary, men, women, even if you think it exists along a more nuanced continuum, it doesn't actually matter what you believe. You still know the content of stereotypes about typical men and women, such that if I ask you, what are some typical stereotypes that exist about men, you can tell me. What would you say? Give me one. What is a typical stereotype about men? Strong. Strong. Okay, good. Give me another one. Confident. What's that? Confident. Confident. Strong. Okay, one more. Leader. Leader. Okay. So leader, confident, strong. I actually heard something else. Direct. Okay, direct, leader, confident, strong. Okay. So again, whether you believe these or not, we all know the content of these cultural stereotypes. And generally, we refer to these as agentic traits and behaviors. They require human agency, they're action-oriented, and again, uh, some of the words here are in line with what uh, you offered, so competitive, ambitious, independent, willing to take risks, strong, agentic behaviors and traits. So similarly, whether you believe them or not, you know the content of cultural stereotypes about women. Give me one. What's a cultural stereotype about women? Indecisive. Nurturing, compassionate. Okay, one more. Indecisive. What was it? Indecisive? Yeah. Okay. And again, just like with men, they're positive and negative, right? You know, whiny, we could go to negative, but we positive, nurturing. So we know these stereotypes. And these are called 
communal, so nurturing, gentle, supportive, sympathetic. Communal traits and behaviors are more strongly associated with women, agentic traits and behaviors more strongly associated with men. So it turns out just knowing these stereotypes, stereotypes creates an expectation so about what men are going to be like, what women are going to be like. So you know, just knowing I was a woman, you had some expectations about sort of the range of clothes I would wear, what you know, sort of the range of behaviors that would make me a woman in this society. That creates an expectancy bias. And in occupations, that creates what's referred to as occupational role congruity, right? So let's just look at medicine. If we assume that um, leadership traits, somebody said leader, strong, decisive, authoritative, are agentic, and if we expect men to be agentic, they have this sort of cognitive congruity afforded to them that women don't have. And if we look at our specialties, those that are high status, high paid, highly technical, orthopedics, urology, neurosurgery, lots of men, very few women, right? If we look at the low status, low paid, sort of communal nurturing specialties where women are offered occupational role congruity, lots of women, pediatrics, geriatrics, primary care, internal medicine. So we also need to know, we also need to remember, and I'm sure you are all familiar with this or you wouldn't be this far along in your lives, that there are social penalties for men or women who behave too far outside the sort of expected norms for men or women. And um, proof of this simply can be underscored by the fact that in our language we have words to describe men or women who violate these norms, right? So, for men, we have words like wimpy or sissy or soft, effeminate. For women, we have words like bossy, domineering. Uh, I'm sure you can think of some other color, emasculating, castrating. I'm sure we could go on and on. But none of these are particularly flattering terms. OK, so this creates a double jeopardy for women leaders, right? Because if they act too much in concert with the feminine gender norm, it triggers the assumption of leadership incompetence and lower valuation either to get into or in a leadership position. And if they act too much in concert with masculine gender norms, it triggers the assumption that they'll be unlikable and hard to work with. And again, they'll get lower valuation. Well, that's kind of depressing. The good news is, as Ora mentioned, the conceptualization of successful leadership is changing. And there's lots of research now showing that across domains, whether it's academics or the military or industry, the most successful leaders are those that lead with a transformational leadership style, which has some agentic behaviors, but also many communal behaviors and many that are gender neutral. But there's a lot of, of communal behaviors that transformational leaders have. They care about uh, their employees. They mentor their employees. They take an interest in the personal life of their employees. And so some re researchers suggest that this may actually offer women an advantage in leadership. So I just want to go over some research bias to opportunity. Um, relevant to women in leadership in terms of getting a leadership position, enacting leadership in that position, and keeping that leadership position once they have it. <coughs> All right. Let's look at some research relevant to getting the leadership position. So on the bias side, there are hundreds of studies showing that there is a tenacious mental model that more strongly links leadership to men. Um, Virginia Shine refers to this as the think manager, think male phenomenon. She showed it exists cross-culturally in the US and Europe and Asia, it's very tenacious. But on the opportunity side, Ashley Shelby Rosette, who's a professor uh, in the business school at Duke, has pointed out that most of the research on gender and leadership has been done at sort of the middle management level, so the division heads, the unit directors. And she shows that when you look at research at the top CEOs, it looks a little different. So I've chosen wherever possible to select an experimental study um, to make my point. So in an experimental study, she took identical 
uh, leaders, CEOs, presidents, top leaders, male or female gendered name. And um, it turns out that for the same described behaviors and credentials, participants in the study rate the woman CEO as being more effective, basically more transformational, more agentic and more communal and overall more effective. And it turned out that those results were completely explained by the fact that there was the assumption that they had to work hard, they had to be better to get there. That the, the acknowledged um, bias in evaluation actually worked in their favor, right? So the, uh, when they got to the top. So again, the good news is that the bias that may work against women all the way along slogging toward top leadership position may actually work in their favor once they achieve a top leadership role. Okay, so um, I'm sure as Luann pointed out in her gentle uh, negotiation or, or gentle self-promotion tomorrow, Luann will point out. So self-promoting women are viewed very negatively. And this can be, said, again, showed experimentally. People will actually give up rewards in order not to work with a self-promoting woman, an experimental study. So that's kind of hard, right? Because if you want to make it to a leadership position, you kind of have to let people know how good you are and what you're doing, talk about your accomplishments. So um, Aminatula and her colleagues found that although women may be penalized for promoting on their own, advocating for themselves, advocating on behalf of themselves, it aligns with the gender stereotype for women to advocate on behalf of others, and they're actually more effective. Well, that's okay, right? We're comfortable with that. So instead of advocating just for us to get a fair salary, we can advocate how worried we are, how bad it would look for the institution when they look at the gender pay inequities across our institution. We are so worried about what the university would look like you know, in the New York Times, and not our own salary. Um, but we can advocate on behalf of our research, on behalf of our team, on behalf of our institution, rather than advocating on behalf of ourselves. Okay, so Michelle Ryan has written a lot about how women may, for the first time, be offered top leadership positions in what she refers to as glass cliff situations, right? So this is where the company's stock is tanking or there's been some you know, public uh, scandal and suddenly women are offered a top leadership position presumably because their value as a leader is lower. So, well, that is kind of a bias, but it could also be an opportunity because it turns out leaders who ask for advice are better leaders, as Aura said. But asking for help violates a male gender norm in a way it does not violate a female gender norm. So it turns out Rosette and colleagues have shown both in a field study and in an experimental study, identical male or female leaders, identical situation, male leaders who ask for help are penalized. They're assumed to be less competent, less effective, a worse fit for the job. Female leaders who ask for help, no penalty at all. Because it's part of our norm, right? We need help. So. <laughs> The good thing is, if you're offered one of these glass leadership positions, ask for a lot of help. Make sure you negotiate for the right kinds of resources to do it, because it may be a wonderful opportunity. And when you take it, be sure you get advice from lots of people. If we can extrapolate from experimental studies, this will not harm you, although it might harm your male colleague. OK, what about research relevant to enacting a leadership position once you get it? So as I said, there's a bias that men and male-associated activities and attributes are imbued with higher status, higher importance, higher competence. Um, so it turns out that the external conferral of status advantages women far more um, in negotiated activities. Again, these are experimental studies, exact kind of situation, an experimental negotiation task, male or female. Men were not advantaged by having a high status title. It didn't matter if they were an entering intern or the director. Women were hugely advantaged by having that external title. 
and the writers thought, well, that's because, again, it's sort of assumed that men are higher status, but women need the title. Okay, knowing this, get a title for whatever you're doing. If you're in some team project, give everybody a title. <laughs> Director of um, meeting development. Director of, uh, you know, summarization. I don't know. Think about it. Because whatever it is, you, if, we can, if we can extrapolate from experimental studies, conferring a title on you as a woman is going to get you a lot more than your male colleague. Okay. Women lead, so research on leadership, a lot of this is now by Alice Egley at Northwestern, um, has shown very little difference, essentially no difference in the effectiveness of male and female leaders. She did a meta-analysis of 45 studies, no difference, minuscule differences. Um, with one exception, women who lead with an autocratic directive style will suffer in evaluation. Sort of, if you lead like a man, you will suffer in evaluation. Okay, well that's kind of a bias, right? Men do not suffer, incidentally. In those studies, men who lead that way do not suffer. But the good thing is, the opportunity is, turns out women are much less likely to lead this way. They're far more likely to lead with a reduction in hierarchy, a more coaching and democratic approach, and to be more transformational, which as I said, is the most effective leadership style and has a lot of communal aspects to it. And experimentally, Madeline Heilman, who's also done a lot of work in this area, has shown that women who combine agentic behaviors and communal behaviors are the most effective leaders. Okay, what about research relevant to keeping the leadership position once you have it? Well, it turns out emotions are gendered too. Sadness is a female gendered emotion. Men who express sadness will be penalized. Anger is a male gendered emotion. Women who express anger will be penalized. And this has been shown experimentally by Breskel and colleagues. Um, again, experimental study. Um, this uh, first uh, study was a hiring study and uh, male or female videotapes, and somebody said, uh, uh, the interviewer, you can see the back of the head, the applicant is being videotaped, and they said, well, what ha what did how did you feel when this happened? And they just say, it made me angry. They don't really show anger, they just say, it made me angry. That simple statement killed the women applicants. Lower salary, less competent, less likely to be a fit for the job. Actually showing anger advantaged the men, so this is really a study I don't like a lot of men to know about. Showing anger gave them a higher salary, more likely to be hired, and I think actually Donald Trump may be a perfect example of this right now. <laughs> so Hillary, do not show anger. <laughs> anyway, um, they did find out, however, that um, if there was an external attribution for the anger, so in a second study, if the woman could say, uh, well, you know, something happened that made me angry. Um, this, I got in, bad information, I don't know, the lights went off, the computer system didn't work. It mitigated, although it did not completely erase the negative impact of being anger. So if you do make the mistake of showing anger, try to blame somebody else for it. <laughs> okay, finally. Leaders in gender stereotype incongruent occupations will suffer more damage after a mistake. So this particular study, again by Breskel, had a male or female presidents of a woman's college, so that would be stereotype incongruent for the man, and male or female police chief, so that would be stereotype incongruent for the woman. And identical credentials, and at baseline, everybody participating in the study thought they would be equally qualified for the job, equally competent, great fit, all good. And then a mistake occurs. So for the women's college, the president did not deploy sufficient campus police for a demonstration. And the police chief, um, some similar mistake happened. And then the stereotype incongruent occupant of that job suffered tremendously, um, again, not qualified for the job, not a good fit, less competent. So knowing that, as soon as you're in a leader in medicine, if you're a woman, you are in a stereotype incongruent role. Even pediatrics, which has had 30% women since 1980, only about 15% of <coughs> chairs are women. So um, what can you do, how can you seize the opportunity here? 
So I couldn't actually find a randomized controlled experiment, but I would say generally it's a good idea to have a wide base of support so that lots of people can rush to your defense if a mistake is made on your watch. But particularly, now knowing what you know about status and gender, particularly have high status men who are willing to vouch for you immediately after a mistake and vouch for your competence and status. Okay, so summary and conclusions. I think this conference is an example of this. Women leaders can be caring, communal, and nice while they effectively lead, inspire, mentor, and build great programs as they individually and collectively make a positive difference in the world. Thank you.